6.4a will talk about inverse trig functions. We spent a handful of lessons talking about um, these trig ratios as functions, you know, things that you can do to angles. And like all things in mathematics, if there is an operation, if there's a function to do something, naturally we would want to undo it. There needs to be a way to um, go backwards. Now, uh, the idea or the logic of an inverse trig function um, stems from the basic idea of inverses, which is something we covered a long, long time ago. So the first thing I want to do is refresh our memories on something I think we did in Unit 2, um, sort of the uh, graphical idea of inverses. From, and I'm just going to go on a limb here, and I say, I think it was unit two. From unit two, we saw that a function is invertible, that is to say, it has an inverse, if and only if its graph passes the horizontal line test. The horizontal line test being a graphical test for one-to-oneness, which is a requirement for um, an inverse existing. So let's take a look at all these trig functions. Now technically every single trig function has its inverse, uh, but I'm only going to focus on the three basic ones, sine, cosine, and tangents. I'm not going to talk about the reciprocal functions because they simply just don't turn up often. Uh, if I ever had to use an inverse of a reciprocal function, I just change it to sines, cosines, and tangents. Well, uh, instead of graphing by hand, let's just use technology. So here is the graph of sine. So I'm going to just quickly copy this. So I don't have to go back and forth here. So Let's take a look at y equals sine of theta. And we can see that this graph here fails the horizontal line test, right? If I take out a horizontal ruler, ruler with degree zero, any horizontal line that I draw, say right here, will always cross the graph in multiple places, right? It doesn't matter where I move this ruler, it will always intersect the graph in more than one place. So technically speaking, the sine function is not invertible. But in mathematics, there just simply needs to be a way to do this. So what mathematicians do is they restrict the domain. What they do is they sort of chop up the graph to go, okay, is there a place where I can sort of erase the picture? Is there any part that I can just sort of cut off, maybe like erase this part, or erase this part, so the graph is one-to-one -one and it collects every single y value. Now technically there's an infinite amount of ways to do this, but the way that every mathematician in the whole universe decides to uh, restrict the domain is from this segment here. So if you notice, the segment that I've highlighted will pass the horizontal line test, so if you only focus on the yellow, no matter what horizontal line uh, I draw, it will only cut the yellow line once, and notice that it contains every single y value of the sine graph, namely everything from 1 to negative 1, right? From 1 to negative 1. So this right here is the restricted domain of the uh, uh, sine graph in order to produce its inverse. Now there's another thing that we need to recall uh, from unit 2 in that the domain and range of a function to its inverse flip-flops. So what is the restricted domain from negative pi halves to positive pi halves? That ends up being the range of the inverse sine function. Likewise, the range of the restricted sine function is from negative 1 to 1. That becomes the domain of the uh, inverse sine function.
you can repeat the same exercise for all of the graphs here. So if I take a look at the cosine function, swap out the sine for cosine, we can see due to the periodic nature of cosine that uh, it is not invertible. It is not one to one because it w waves on, it wiggles on forever, forever, forever. So mathematicians, just like with the sine graph, the mathematicians have to cut the graph in such a way that it will be one to one and contain all of the y values possible. And the way that the mathematicians like to cut the cosine graph or restrict the cosine graph is in this manner. <coughs> Excuse me. So hopefully we can see here that it passes the horizontal line test and it contains every single y value from one to negative one. Similarly, what is his domain restriction? His domain restriction is from zero to pi. Last, we can do the same thing for tangent. Y equals tangent of theta. Let's take a look at the tangent graph. And the tangent is sort of nice in that mathematicians, we really didn't need to decide where to chop up or cut off the graph. The tangent graph sort of naturally does it on its own uh, because you can see here how it definitely fails the horizontal line tests. But if you only focus on one image, on one period, on one cycle of the tangent function, it is one to one. It does uh, uh, pass the horizontal line test. So this, what is highlighted, is typically what mathematicians um, use to, to restrict the domain in order to make the tangent function one to one. And again, the domain restrictions from negative pi halves to positive pi halves. Why am I focused on these domain restrictions here? Because again, um, the relationship between a function and its domain, uh, a function and its inverse, is that the domain and range flip flop. So let's go ahead and summarize. Uh, what these three pictures describe to us in a table. Uh, actually, before we summarize, let's talk about notation. Right? If you have a function y, or let's do use function notation. If f of theta equals sine of uh, sine of theta, then its inverse is denoted. Uh, by putting a little subscript of negative 1 in between the angle and the trig function, right? And you can substitute this for cosine, tangent, so on and so forth. However, there are two generally accepted ways of denoting an inverse trig function. You can use this negative 1 notation or it is also sometimes called arc sine. Right? So you can sometimes use literally ARK sine so that's two generally accepted ways of denoting inverse trig, using this negative one notation or putting the word arc in front of the, um, of the trig function. So let's go ahead and summarize um, what we talked about in a sort of table, right? So here's a summary table of the three main inverse trig functions. Uh, this table will have three columns. The first will be the name of the function. In the middle column will be what the domain is. And again, remember what the domain is, what you input. And then the last column will be the range. And again, if you forgot what the range meant, it's what you expect.
to get out. Right. So the first function is, let's talk, talk about the inverse sine function. There's two ways to denote it with a negative one notation or simply called arc sine. His domain is negative one to one. That's the only numbers I can put inside an inverse sine function. And the only angles the inverse sine function will give me are all angles between negative pi halves and positive pi halves. That is it. Uh, inverse sine cannot give you obtuse angles, inverse positive or negative. Uh, inverse sine can only give you positive or negative acute angles. Why is that the case? Well, it, the reason why it's the case is because of this domain restriction business here. The inverse cosine function or the arc cosine function, you can only put in negative one to one because that was the range of the regular function. And the only angles you'll get out are angles between zero and pi radians or zero and 180 degrees. You can never ever get negative answers using an inverse cosine function and you can never ever get angles bigger than 180 degrees or pi radians. What about the inverse tan function? So tan inverse or arctan. You can put anything in an inverse tangent function. This stand symbol means all real numbers. But the only angles you'll get out is just like the sine function are positive or negative acute angles from negative 90 degrees to positive 90 degrees, negative pi radians to positive pi radians. Notice that I use open parentheses instead of closed brackets because those are where the vertical asymptotes lie. So what does this mean to you? It simply means that when you're working with inverse trig functions, not only do you need to know your special angles, but you need to also know uh, your special side ratios and know whenever you're in the correct range. So you basically need to know the special triangles. We need to know special triangles. Your 30, 60, 90 triangle. 30, 60, 1, 2, square root of 3, and your 45, 45, 90 triangle. 45, 45, 1, 1, radical 2, and of course, their um, radian equivalent. So just like with 6.3, this section isn't hard in terms of the work involved. It is 99% logic, and if you don't have the logic, if you don't have the thought process, this will be difficult. But let's just dive into an example. Suppose I ask you to evaluate cosine inverse of negative radical 3 over 2. So there's going to be a lot of logic that's going to be written down. So this is not what I typically expect you to write down, but what I expect you to think. So what's the logic involved? This translates. This is asking. Remember, it's going backwards to a regular trig function. A trig function, you get an angle and you're asked to find the ratio. This is asking for an angle. This is asking what angle has a cosine value of negative radical 3 over 2. That's what this question is asking you to do. So the first thing I do is I don't get hung up on the negative. Don't worry about this negative here. We'll take care of it later. I just focus on the value itself, the ratio, radical 3 over 2. Those side lengths should look familiar, right? So I should ask myself, what special uh, triangles uses side lengths radical 3 and 2. Right? And I hope we can all answer ourselves in, 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 and the answer is the 30, 60, 90 triangle. Once I have that in mind, um, I ask myself, 
what angle has a cosine which is adjacent over hypotenuse of radical 3 over 2. And again, if you know your special triangle, you should know that that is 30 degrees, or all these problems will be in radians, pi 6 radians. Right? However, I need to know that the range of cosine inverse is all angles between 0 and pi. Does my previous logic, uh, previous answer, fit? And of course, you know, pi 6 is within 0 and pi, so that's, that's good. Right. However, what about that negative? We sort of ignore the negative. Um, our problem was, or is, not was, is cosine inverse of negative radical 3 over 2. I asked myself, where is cosine negative? And hopefully we can answer that. We should know that cosine is negative in quadrant 2 and quadrant 3. Knowing that our answer could be possibly in quadrant 2 and quadrant 3, and that the answer has to be between 0 and pi halves, I know our answer must be in quadrant 2. So you take your reference angle, that's what you really saw for up here, pi 6. You take your reference angle and put it in quadrant 2. So, what is your real answer? Well, you got to figure out what the basic angle is, and hopefully you remember this from unit 5. That's 5 pi 6. Hence, cosine inverse of negative radical 3 over 2 is 5 pi over 6. That's a lot of thought process for, this is the entire work here. So if you were to ignore all the writing above, because the writing above should be thought, thinking, these problems should are just like, you know, you can either figure it out or you can't. There's no solving, there's no uh, balancing the equations, uh, there's no formulas, it's all thinking. And this is the stuff you should be thinking. What angle has a sine, cosine, tangent, whatever they tell you, uh, of, of the input? Think about what special triangle it relates to. Uh, think about what that reference angle is. Think about what quadrant you're in. And then finally, think about your final answer. So let's just go ahead and uh, we'll do a, a few more just so you guys get the idea or the feel of it. So let's do another example. Suppose I ask you to evaluate sine inverse of radical 3 over 2. The first thing I ask myself is, what special triangle am I using that yet uses side lengths of radical 3 over 2? Well, clearly, I'll be thinking about the 30, 60, 90 triangle. Now remember, sine inverse of radical 3 over 2 should give you some angle. But what's so special about the angle? That angle's sine value should be radical 3 over 2. So ask yourself, what angle has a sine value of radical 3 over 2? <laughs> Excuse me again. Well, I hope it doesn't take a lot of thought process. You should know that that's pi third radians. 
Now this here, radical 3 over 2, is positive. So we should know that sine is positive in quadrants 1 and 2. The range of arc sine or the inverse sine is negative pi halves to positive pi halves, right? The positive and negative acute angles, or in other words, the first and the fourth quadrant. Right? So knowing that this must be true, knowing that this must be true, what is the only quadrant that we're in? We are in the first quadrant. So if you put the reference angle of pi thirds in the first quadrant, what is the real answer? Well, it happens to be the same because you know, acute angles are always its own reference. Therefore, sine inverse of radical 3 over 2 equals pi thirds. So again, the, the, all of this stuff here should be mental work. It should be your thought process. So this is a thinking question. Let's do a handful more. Suppose I ask you to find cosine inverse of negative 1 half. Right. So 1 half, what a, a triangle, what special triangle utilizes the side lengths 1 and 2? So that's the 30, 60, 90. So cosine inverse of negative one half should give me an angle such that the cosine of that angle is, I'm going to ignore the negative for now, one half. Uh, so what is that special angle? What angle gives me a cosine value of one half? And we should know it's 60 degrees, pi thirds radians. Now, since, here's our problem this is negative where is cosine negative we should know that cosine is negative here in the second and third quadrant but since it's the inverse cosine function what is the range of cosine inverse we should know it's from 0 to pi, cosine 1, cos uh, uh, quadrant 1 and quadrant 2. So what is the only possible place where this angle here, cosine inverse of negative 1 half, where is the only possible place that it could live if, since it's negative, it needs to be in quadrant 2 and quadrant 3, and because it's in the cosine inverse, it can only live in quadrant 1 and quadrant 2. Well, clearly, quadrant 2 is the only place it can live, right? So we are going to put our reference angle of pi thirds inside of quadrant 2. So here's a reference angle of pi thirds. If that is the case, what is my real answer? Therefore, my real answer, cosine inverse of negative 1 half, is 2 pi thirds. Test yourself. If you truly understand this concept, test yourself with this next one, tangent inverse of 1. Pause the video because I'm just going to go straight to the answer. So this is the thought process. Um, what special triangles, uh, now remember, since trig ratios are ratios or fractions, 1 is the same thing as 1 over 1. So which special triangle utilizes side lengths 1, 1? That's the 45, 45, 90 triangle. Which angle has a tangent value of 1? That's the 45 degrees, pi fourths. Where is tangent positive? Tangent po is positive in the first and the third quadrant. But inverse tangent, because that's what we're dealing with here, only gives me answers in the first and the fourth quadrant. So it has to be the uh, first quadrant. So, um, first quadrant, pi fourths, the answer must be pi fourths, right? So that's how quick and easy these guys should be if you have the thought process down.
Now, one thing that uh, these math problems like to do is they like to compose these inverse trig functions with regular trig functions. And that sounds hard, that sounds difficult, but it just utilizes 6.3 and 6.2 knowledge uh, uh, of uh, that we've been practicing, which is drawing a picture. So for example, you might get problems that look like this. Uh, evaluate cosine of sine inverse of 6 elevenths. Now this looks like a difficult problem, but it really isn't once you understand what's going on here. So the first thing I want to do is focus on the input here. Sine inverse of 6 elevenths gives us an angle, right? That's the whole job of an inverse trig function, to spit out angles. Well, what's so special about this angle? In other words, sine inverse of 6 over 11 equals some angle theta, such that, what do I know about this theta? That the sine of that specific theta equals 6 over 11. Hey, we know a specific trig ratio. Back in 6.3 and 6.2, if you know a specific trig ratio, you can always draw a triangle. So we're going to draw a triangle here with this theta. And what do I know about this theta? I know his sine opposite over hypotenuse is 6 over 11. And then I can use Pythagoras' theorem to figure out the missing side. So using Pythagoras' theorem, the missing side is going to be radical 85. Now, this should be an easy problem to read. Cosine of sine inverse of 6 elevenths should equals cosine of some angle. But what's so special about this angle? This angle here, let me highlight it, use a highlighter. This angle here is the same as that angle. So can't we just read? What is the cosine of that angle? So Katoa, we can just read that that is radical 85 over 11. Right. So once you get the understand, let me let me go ahead and write this down. This is the big idea, right? Inverse trig functions. Um, take in angles and gives out or takes in ratios excuse me takes in values and gives out angles if nothing else that's what you walk away with this will take care of most of your problems that the outputs the answer to inverse trig ratios are always angles symbolically if you need um, if you need uh, to uh, like some symbols like math equations, if I have a regular trig, uh, if I have an inverse trig function, right, and I put something inside of it, say x, and it gives me an answer, say y. What's so special about those uh, the relationship between x and y? That says if you were to take a regular, in this case, sine of that y value, that should give you your original x. We can use this big idea, we use this big idea uh, to solve the previous example. So let's go ahead and just do, let's do a handful more just so you guys get comfortable with it. Suppose I ask you to find cosine of tan inverse of four thirds. I don't mean the extra parentheses. Well, remember this guy here, that's a tangent inverse, that should equal an angle. What's so special about that angle? I know for a fact, I can bet money that the tangent of that angle is 4 thirds. Therefore, I can draw a picture. Tangent, opposite of adjacent, I know is 4 over 3, and I can use Pythagoras' theorem to figure out the missing side length. The missing side length is 5. Thus, I can answer the question. Cosine of tangent inverse of 4 thirds is just the cosine of this picture. Well, in that picture, I can just read that cosine is 3 fifths, right? So if you want to test yourself to see if you really know it, go ahead and do this one on your own. Just pause the video. Don't let me tell you the answer.
What is the cosecant of the cosine inverse of 7 fifths? So again, if you want to try this on your own, pause the video uh, and just fast forward it to the answer when you're done. But for the rest of us, again, this guy here should equal an angle such that the cosine of that angle is 7 over 25. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. And if I use Pythagoras' theorem to figure out the missing side, this is going to be 24. So then the whole answer is just the cosecant of this picture. And then just looking at this picture, cosecant, which is the reciprocal of sine, I can see that the answer is 25 over 24. That's how quickly, fast, and easy these problems should be. And don't get freaked out if they take out the numbers and use variables. It works the same way even with variables. So if I ask you to find, for example, the tangent of cosine inverse of x, right. remember, what does this mean? This equals an angle such that the cosine of the angle is x. Remember, trig ratios are always fractions, so x is the same thing as x over 1. So when you draw your picture, I know that the adjacent is x and the hypotenuse is 1. So when you do Pythagoras' theorem, let's, you know, let's call this, I don't know, sine length a, whatever. Using Pythagoras' theorem, we know that x squared plus a squared equals 1. And if I'm solving for a, I want to figure out the sine length of a. That's just the square root of 1 minus x squared. I didn't bother with plus or minus because I'm solving for a side length of a triangle and side lengths are always positive. Right? So this is uh, the square root of 1 minus x squared. So then we can just simply read it. What is the tangent of this picture? Well, tangent is opposite over adjacent. It's the square root of 1 minus x squared over x. So just like 6.3, there is a lot of thinking involved with these problems. The act of actually solving them should be quick, fast, and easy if you know what you're doing. But it takes a lot of practice, it takes a lot of thinking, and it takes a lot of understanding. So please, devote the majority of this time uh, of this lesson not to just answer the question, because answering the question is easy. I want you to truly understand the relationship between a function, a trig function, and its inverse. Good luck.